Hello everyone, uh, I am Dheeraj and today we will be starting a new course on quantum entanglement and non-local games. Uh, this course is completely free and you will be able to access videos of every lecture. So today is the first lecture of this course. Uh, the prerequisites for this course include uh, basics of quantum states, operators and quantum measurement. Uh, you will also need to have familiarity with basics of linear algebra, operators. So you will need to know what is a Hermitian and a unitary operator. Okay, so what are the contents of this course? So, the contents of this course include quantum non-local games. And what are these? So, we will actually describe them formally. But uh, if you are familiar with CHSH game for example, wherein what we see is that there are two players and each is given some input and they have to produce some output. And finally, what we want is that the output should have some correlations and uh, these sort of correlations can be obtained through uh, quantum entanglement and uh, however, these correlations cannot be uh, produced classically. So uh, that's what we will be seeing in this course. So if you look at the subtopics, we we'll look at CHSH game and its generalization which happens to be XOR games. We will look at uh, the magic, magic square game and its generalization also which is the BLS game. We will also look at uh, So we'll also look at uh, infinite dimensional games and for each of the games we'll also look at their corresponding, uh, so for each of the games we'll look at the corresponding optimality proofs as well. Okay, So we'll try to see what is the best a quantum algorithm can do in winning such a game. So, what is the reference for this? So, uh, a good reference for this course are notes by Professor Cleave on non-local effects and entanglement. So, I will be posting a link to these notes in the description box below. So let us review. So firstly in today's lecture, uh, we are basically going to review basics of quantum states and operators and uh, we will also uh, see uh, the CHSH game again. Uh, we will also look at the magic square game which might be new to some of you. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is what we plan to cover today. And of course, we we'll look at the general framework of quantum games. Okay, the framework of uh, what is a quantum game, what are the inputs, outputs. Okay, and uh, so the formal definition of quantum game is also what we will see today. So we start with the basics of uh, quantum, uh, basics of quantum states and operations. So let us start with this review. So first let us review what is a quantum state. So a quantum state is essentially a unit norm vector
in a Hilbert space and I will always be denoting a Hilbert space by the symbol H. So, I will use the symbol psi for state. So, psi belongs to H. So, psi is a vector and norm psi equals to 1. Uh, so, a Hilbert space as you might be familiar with is essentially a complex inner product space which is complete under the standard norm okay. and uh, by completeness what it means is that it is a uh, like here every Cauchy sequence is convergent. Okay. So, one thing you might note that for finite dimensional complex inner uh, product space completeness comes for free that is every finite dimensional complex inner product space is complete. However, note that for infinite dimensional spaces this need not be true and we need completeness as an additional axiom. Uh, we will actually look at uh, some games wherein we need actually infinite dimensional spaces. So, for there we always need to check whether the, uh, the Hilbert space which we are defining is indeed a complete one or not. Okay. But for the first part of this course we will be dealing with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So, here the dimension is uh, we will we'll denote D for the dimension. So, here we have that H is a finite dimensional Hilbert space or it is isomorphic to C to the power D. The basis set is what we will denote by cat 0, cat 1 up to cat t minus 1. So, these are all orthonormal vectors. So, these are all unit vectors and they are also orthogonal to each other. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we also talk about the notion of a joint state. So, what is a joint state? Suppose if Alice holds a state psi a which belongs to H a and Bob holds a state psi b in the Hilbert space H b. Then the joint state psi will lie in the tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces H A tensor H B. Okay. Uh, and this is something I will denote by H joint. Okay. And here if it so happens that each of them have access to their own pure states then actually psi will be equal to psi A tensor psi B as well. So, this is assuming that this psi was actually a product split. But for entangled states, we can't do this thing. We can't write it as uh, uh, psi a tensor psi b. But of course, psi will always lie in h a tensor h b. Okay, and this is also written as h joint. Another thing you may note that if h a is isomorphic to c to the power d, and h b is isomorphic to c to the power d, then h a tensor h b or H joint will be isomorphic to C to the power D tensor C to the power D. So, here we can actually denote the basis. So, we will denote the basis here by that J comma K here j and k both lie between 0 to d minus 1. Okay. Okay, so, the number of elements in this basis is going to be d square right, as expected. The third thing which we look at now is this idea of quantum measurement. More specifically, we look at projective measurements in this course. So, 
so what are projective measurements so suppose if we have a set of complete orthogonal operators say pi 1 up to pi k which satisfy pi k square equals pi k and pi k dagger equals to pi k. So these two conditions together form the condition for orthogonal projections. And for completeness, we have an additional condition that sum over k pi k must be identity. Okay. So here we can define uh, uh, a set of such operators. These are called as projective. Uh, these are called as the complete orthogonal operators. And uh, here, if we if we make a measurement, what does it mean to make a measurement under under the set of these? Uh, complete orthogonal projections so these are projection operators so here measuring these operators is equivalent to following that if i have the state psi then i'm going to obtain k with probability in in a product psi pi k psi Here we can even define a post measurement state. So this post measurement state is going to be pi k psi over square root of psi pi k psi. So note that this post measurement state is also normal uh, is also a unit vector okay and uh, you can also check from the completeness condition that the to, uh, that if I sum over k the probability of obtaining k is actually 1. So this indeed satisfies the axioms of probability and of course since uh, pi k is also positive semi definite this is also greater than equal to 0. So you will need to check that all the axioms of probability are satisfied. Secondly, you will also need to check that this post measurement state which we have defined is actually a unit vector. Now, we will define the idea of an observable. So given a Hermitian operator A, so a Hermitian operator as you know satisfies that A dagger equals to A. So given such a Hermitian operator A, we can consider its spectral decomposition as sum over k lambda k pi k where pi k is form a complete set of orthogonal projectors. And these lambda k's are the corresponding eigenvalues. So we can write such a decomposition of A. So here measuring A this is equivalent to performing
performing a projective measurement with respect to pi 1 up to pi k. Okay. Now, under this projective measurement, the probability of obtaining k this equals psi pi k psi therefore the expected value so actually when i obtain k i actually uh, my my output is uh, i write my output as lambda k okay so the semantics of this projection uh, this measuring a is for is as follows that you, we measure with respect to pi 1 up to pi k and when we get the outcome k we say we are obtaining we are receiving lambda k the eigen state correspond eigen value corresponding to pi k so the probability of obtaining lambda k is psi pi k psi so the expected value we get is sum over k lambda k psi pi k psi which equals psi a psi so just verify that this is true okay and uh, the next thing which i want to discuss uh, is this idea of tensor product of observables so okay so let me continue So consider observables A and B. So observable is what we just defined. It is a Hermitian operator, and we are considering measurements with respect to the projector in it, projectors in its spectral decomposition. The corresponding eigenvalues for each projectors form the value I receive when a given projector is measured. So now we consider observables A and B. on Hilbert spaces H A and H B. Okay. Then A tensor B is an observable on H A tensor H B. Right. The reason is that uh, since A and B are both Hermitian, so A tensor B dagger is also going to be A dagger tensor B dagger, which is A tensor B. So A, A tensor B is also a Hermitian operator. And we can also check that A tensor B over here is equal to sum over I j lambda I lambda j pi I A tensor pi j b so i am denote i am superscripting the projectors by a and b also just to distinguish that in which hilbert space they lie so now here uh, we see that uh, the new projectors are given by pi i a tensor pi j b with their corresponding eigen values as lambda i lambda j so thus we get lambda i lambda j with probability psi a b pi i a tensor pi j b psi a b so here psi a b is the state in the joint hilbert space and pi i a tensor pi j b is the projector onto this hilbert space now we are although we have already defined what is an observable a special case happens when these eigenvalues are plus and minus one so here we can talk about a binary observable as well
so an observable with eigenvalues in the set plus and minus 1 is called a binary observable. So for such an observable, we can check that psi a psi for, an, for any unit vector psi, this will be equal to psi times uh, pi plus 1 minus pi minus 1 psi which equals the probability of obtaining plus 1 minus the probability of obtaining minus 1. Uh, uh, okay, so this is basically the uh, I, I can write it more in a, in a more uh, terse form as probability plus 1 minus probability minus 1. This happens to be the bias of observable. Right. So, bias is that what is the uh, what is the excess of probability of plus 1 over probability of minus 1. So, here we will actually see that when we are analyzing quantum non-local games, this idea of bias is quite important. And uh, for binary observables, it, it, it is actually, it can also be uh, written as the expectation of this observable. So, here the expectation is same as the bias. Now, the next uh, revision topic which I plan to do is the idea of a maximally entangled state. So here a maximally entangled state in d dimensions is defined as psi equals 1 over root d sum over k from 0 up to d minus 1 get k comma k. So here uh, let us also, so for example for d equals 2. my psi is going to be 1 by root 2 0 0 plus 1 by root 2 1 1. So, this special case is called an EPR pair. So, EPR the initial stand for Einstein Podolsky Rosen. Now, uh, we are going to see three identities now and uh, at this point I would also like you to pause the video to prove these identities. So, these are as follows. So, I will give you the proofs as well, but first I would want you to try these as well. So, let me just state what are these. So, for all A in C D cross D, A tensor I on psi which is the maximally entangled state equals I tensor A transpose psi maximally entangled the second lemma is that if i take this product psi of course psi everywhere is maximally entangled in these three lemmas So, A is any d cross d matrix in the second lemma also and here if A and B are both d cross d matrices and uh, psi again is a maximally entangled state then psi A conjugate tensor B psi equals 1 by d of trace of A dagger B. So, here when I say that uh, A bar, so A bar denotes the uh, conjugate of A which is every entry of A which is conjugated. When I say A dagger, it is actually the adjoint of A 
for finite dimensional matrices it corresponds to uh, taking a transpose as well as conjugating every entry. So at this point I would want you to pause the video for 10, 15, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or whatever time you need and prove these lemmas. Okay, So we will actually keep using these lemmas throughout the course. Okay. Hello, welcome back. So before the break I left you with three lemmas and now we will try to prove each of them. As I said before, each of these three is quite essential uh, for each of the techniques which we learn in the rest of the course. So first let's start with the first lemma that is uh, for any A in uh, for any A which is a T cross T matrix I have that A cross I uh, a tensor i acting on the maximally entangled state psi is i tensor a transport acting on uh, the maximally entangled state. Uh, so before that let me also review the definition of the maximally entangled state. So it is essentially 1 over square root d sum over k k comma k. Okay. Uh, so let us try to prove the first lemma. So in order to uh, prove this uh, lemma, what I'll do is that I just expand out the definition of psi max. So it is a tensor i 1 over square root t sum over k, k comma k. Okay. And this equals 1 over square root t sum over k, a k tensored with identity acting on k which just happens to give me k. Get k. And now what happens when A acts on get k, right? So when A acts on get k, what happens is that, so A is a square matrix of size t cross t and get k is like a one hot vector with one in the kth position. So when I will multiply this, I am going to pick out the kth column of A, right? So here what I will do is that I will sum over all the rows j and I choose the kth column ajk get j. This thing is tensored with get k. Okay. So this is 1 over square root d sum over j get j sum of tensored with sum over k ajk get k. So I have just rearranged the terms. Okay, So this is the expression we have and uh, so now what I will do is that I will try to show that this expression is equivalent to I, I tensor A transpose acting on psi max. So this is what we aim to do. So let us see what we get over here. So I have 1 over square root d and uh, so I have sum over j, cat j, tensored with sum over k, e j k, cat k. This is what I copied from the last slide. And uh, now let us see what is this exactly. So what I claim is that this is nothing but a transpose acting on cat j. And uh, why is it so? Because A transpose, when it acts on cat j, it picks out the jth column of A transpose, right? which is nothing but the jth row of A. And the jth row of A consists of entries A, J, K, and then I, I have this running index K. Right? So this is nothing but A transpose J. And the rest of the term is sum over J, cat J, tensored A transpose J. So this is nothing but I tensored A transpose acting on sum over j. So there is a 1 by root d of course and then we have j j and this is nothing but psi max again. So we have 
essentially proves that A tensor I psi max is I tensor A transpose psi max. Okay. So now we will try to prove the second lemma which says that uh, the matrix A bracketed between the psi max is, is uh, th this gives me 1 by D trace of A. So let me prove the second lemma. So what I need to do is that I need to compute this value. Okay, so psi is always the maximally entangled state for these three lemmas and uh, okay, so let's see how to prove this. Okay, so here A is actually a D cross D matrix, but this acts on the tensor product space of uh, CD cross CD. So there's actually an A tensor I. So this expression should be understood as uh, the size which bracket A tensor I. Yeah, so there is actually a uh, mistake here. Yeah, so this is actually the statement of the lemma. So we'll try to prove this. Okay. So let us expand out uh, these Simex terms. So I have one over root t, sum over j, and then with a bra I have j j and then I have a tensor i in between and then I have a sum over k so let me just sum over k as well and k k and then there is a 1 by root d factor also correspondingly okay so overall I have something like 1 by root 1 by d sum over j k bra j j a tensor i and then get k k so i have this one. okay so what is this going to be let's see so this is 1 over d and then i have a which is sandwiched between j and k so so i have a which is sandwiched between j and k and i which i which is sandwiched between j and k so this is this term is nothing but delta j k and this term is nothing but a j k so when i sum over uh, k for example then sum over k delta j k will only pick out those entries where j equals k so i can write it as sum over j a j j which is nothing but trace of A and then there is of course a 1 by D factor. So this proves the second lemma as well. Okay. So let's proceed to the third lemma. So third lemma here says that if I have a psi which sandwiches uh, A conjugate tensor B then I am going to get trace of A dagger B over D. So, I have psi which lies between, uh, uh, I have psi which sandwich A conjugate tensor B. So, this is just A conjugate where every entry of A is conjugated. Okay. So, and of course, these are maximally entangled state. Right? So, this always goes without saying. So, we need to show that this equals 1 by D trace of A dagger B. So, let's see how to prove this. So actually what I'll do is that I'll use the first two lemmas. So this will be like a corollary now. So I have the maximally entangled state psi max and A conjugate tensor B I can write it as A conjugate tensor I times 
I tensor B and then I have psi max okay and uh, now this equals so so I'll use the first lemma okay so which says that uh, if I have like I tensor A acting on psi it, it is like A transpose tensor I So what I do is that I, I write this part as uh, B transpose tensor I. So here we are essentially using the lemma 1. Right? Actually I am using the lemma 1 in the reverse direction because over there what I do is that if I shift from left to right I get a transpose. Now I am shifting from right to left. But convince yourself that if, if I can shift from uh, left to right with the transpose I can also do it from right to left. Uh, because uh, the self transpose, so if I do B transpose transpose that equals B. So that is something you will need to check. And uh, yeah, so now I combine these two. So what do I get? I get here psi max A conjugate times B transpose tensor I and then I have psi right and now I use the second lemma which says that this has to be trace of A conjugate B transpose Okay, and now what I am going to do is that since the trace of a matrix is same as the trace of its transpose, so I will take the transpose of this entire thing and this essentially gives me this thing transposed, so there is a transpose, yeah it is not a dagger actually, so just a transpose. And here this will be B times A conjugate transpose. And conjugate of transpose is now A dagger. Yeah. And now by cyclicity of trace, I can write it as 1 by D times trace of A dagger B also. Yeah, because trace of AB is same as trace of B. Okay. So just convince yourself that uh, you have understood the proof of the three lemmas okay if there are still doubts you can still ask in the comments okay and uh, just to recollect what we have shown is that i can transfer a from uh, the first hilbert space to the second hilbert space with the transpose i have shown that uh, the expected value of an observable which is on the only on the first qubit uh, on, on the on the first Hilbert space that will be like proportional to trace of A and I have also shown that if I have to take expected value of uh, A conjugate tensor B then it will be like trace of A dagger B over D. So over D is a just a scaling factor. Yeah. So we have proven these three lemmas and you will see we will use them a lot now. Okay. Now to introduce the idea of uh, these non-local games, I will actually start with an example. So the first example which we are going to see is the CHSH game. So for many of you, this will also be like kind of a revision, I know that. Uh, yeah, but let's just go over it. So in CHSH game, what we have is that uh, we have two players. Okay, so we have two players, Alice and Bob. 
and these two players are separated in space okay so there is no communication between them and these players are assumed to be collaborating with each other okay so they are not uh, adversarial to each other they are trying to help each other and they are playing this sort of a game and uh, they'll need to together they'll need to collaborate in such a way that they are able to win the game so each of them is given an input and i'm going to write the alice's input as s and bob's input as t So each of these is actually a single bit, so it is either 0 or 1 and they are given one of these bits uniformly at random. So you are just given a sample S and T each from uh, randomly sampled from 0 and 1. And uh, in the end Alice needs to output A and Bob needs to output B which are again bits. So each of these is also a single bit and they win the game okay, so there is a winning condition we have that they win the game if the and of inputs equals the xor of outputs so let us try to understand this condition what it means is that suppose if s and t are both one then I want that the output should be opposite to each other. So either it's 0 and 1 or it's 1 and 0. That's on, that's the, these are the only cases where XOR is going to be 1. So in order to win the game, if both your inputs are 1, then I should output uh, bits with opposite parity. And if they are actually, uh, if it is the case that at least one of the inputs is 0, say it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, then in these three cases, what I would want is that uh, they, they output the same bit, that they output the same parity. Because here I would want that since the input, the and of input is 0, I would want that XOR must be 0. So this is like a winning condition. And uh, what their goal is that they should maximize the probability of winning. So each of these bits S and T is uniformly sampled from 0, 1. And so there are four possibilities that e both are 0 with probability 1 fourth, both are 1, 1, 0 and 1 and 1 and 0. So uh, each of these has probability of 1 fourth and now they need to maximize the probability of success. Okay. Uh, so let's see how to do it classically first. Okay. So let's try a classical approach first. So classically, so let's try to analyze the correct output for each of the cases. So with one fourth probability, my S and T are going to be both zero. With one fourth probability, S is zero, T is one. With one fourth probability, S is one and T is zero. And with one fourth probability, both are going to be one. Okay. Now let's look at what is the value of A, X or B for winning. So here note that S and T is 0. So I will need A, X or B to be 0 for winning. Again I will need A, X or B to be 0 for winning. Again I see that S and T is 0. So I will need A, X or B to be 0 for winning. And here I see that S and T is going to be 1. So here A, X or B must be 1 in order to win. Now the question is that I can easily win with probability 3 fourth if A and B are always the same. Okay, so then, then you don't have to think much. So Alice just outputs 0 each time, Bob just outputs one, uh, 0 each time. Both of them output 0 each time. And then in 3 of the 4 cases, 
so they their axrp is always going to be zero and in three of the four cases they are going to win the game so they will win the game with probability 3 4 here okay the question is that can we do better okay so let's see let's see this now suppose alice and bob have a deterministic strategy which means that given their own input s uh, given its own input s alice can only output a as a deterministic function of s and similarly bob can output a b as a deterministic function of t so we are only looking at deterministic strategies now can you may win in all four cases right so the thing is that since these are deterministic strategies based on the inputs s and t they can win only uh, like uh, either you win in all four cases or you win in three or you win in two or you win in one okay so we've already seen one way where they can win three out of these four cases getting a success probability of three fourth now the question is that can you win in all four of these so let's try to understand what would be an algorithm where they can win with uh, where they can win in all four cases so suppose uh, okay so here one, one caution is that note that alice's deterministic output can only depend on s and bob's one can only depend on t alice can't take t as input right because t is only given to bob and alice and bob are separated in space so alice has not provided t at all and similarly bob is not provided s at all so let's say that Alice outputs a bit alpha when zero is the input. Okay, so Alice has some has one of its functions and Alice outputs alpha on getting zero. And let's now suppose they want to win in all four cases. Then they have to win in the first case also. Since the the a x or b which is needed is zero, so here Bob also must output alpha. So here we are assuming that alpha is a bit which is either zero or one. Okay, so we haven't fixed that. Now, since Alice's function is a deterministic, Alice's output is a deterministic function of s, and s is zero here when it outputs alpha. Since s is also zero in the second case, so Alice must still output alpha in the second case. If the, they want to win the game together here, since a x or b is going to be zero, so Bob also must output alpha, so that a x or b is going to be zero, which equals s and t. Now let's look at the third case. In the third case, uh, so in third case we see that uh, the value of t, the Bob's input in the first case and Bob's input in the third case, they match each other. Okay, so here we see that this zero and this zero they match each other. So here, since these two match, so here the output of Bob must be same. So Bob still must output alpha because Bob outputted alpha here. And now since they want that A X R B must be zero, which means that Alice uh, must still output alpha. Now look at the fourth case. So we see that uh, the Alice's input for the fourth case and the third case, they match. Alice outputs alpha in the third case. So Alice must still output alpha in the fourth case. And now Bob, if you want to see, uh, so here the for Bob now the output of Bob in the second uh, the input of Bob in the second case and fourth case they match, since Bob outputs alpha in the second case, Bob also must output alpha in the fourth case. But what do we see? A X or B here is going to be zero, which is not equal to one, and uh, which means that if they want to win the first three cases, they lose in that fourth case and uh, they can win with probability at max three fourth right so you can't win all four out of uh, all four on four cases uh, using a classical deterministic strategy okay so this is one way to prove that the success prob the maximum success probability is three fourth another way is a more algebraic one so let's see So algebraically, we want to simultaneously satisfy uh, these four equations. So here we are assuming that A naught. So okay, 
let me say that when s is input ls outputs a s so s can be 0 and 1 so on when input is 0 then ls outputs a 0 when input is 1 ls outputs a 1 so these are all bits similarly when input is t for bob it outputs b sub t so when t is 0 it outputs b sub 0 when t is 1 it outputs b sub 1 and suppose we want to win all four cases simultaneously then we are going then we need to simultaneously satisfy the following four equations firstly that when both inputs are 0 then the xor must be 0 when the first input is 0 and the second is 1 then xor still must be 0 when the first input is 1 and second is 0 then xor still must be 0 but when both the inputs are 1 then I would want a1 xor b1 this has to be equal to 1 okay so let's see where, where can, does there exist a simultaneous solution to these four equations so let's see whether we can have that and the answer is of course no uh, so how do we show this so the thing is that if I take XOR of these four equations then the XOR of the left hand side will consist of a0 XOR a0 XOR a1 XOR a1 which is 0 and b0 XOR b0 which is 0 b1 XOR b1 is 0 so on the left hand side the XOR is 0 and on the right hand side the XOR is going to be 1 so I'll get something like 0 equals to 1 which is completely wrong so we can't satisfy all four equations simultaneously and we can satisfy at max three of them so here the success probability is again three fourths because each of these four inputs occurs with probability one fourth each okay now here although we have been talking about winning the game and losing the game a more formal way to put it is in terms of value functions so what is a value function so first we need to define the set of inputs for Alice which I'm going to call s set of Alice's inputs then we have T which is the set of Bob's inputs and uh, then we have A which is the set of Alice's outputs And then we have B which is the same as again the bit set 0 1 which is the set of Bob's output Bob's outputs okay and then I have a value function value function is from s cross t cross a cross b so it takes as input a b s t so a is in a b is in b s is in s and t is in t and uh, this is going to be either 1 or 0 and it is 1 if uh, a x or b is s and t and 0 otherwise so here we see that we are winning the game and here we see we lose the game and we want to maximize the probability of winning okay so what we are trying to do is that we are trying to maximize the expectation of where s and t are like uniformly distributed we want to maximize the expected value of v of uh, a b s t okay and uh, apart from this value function we can also define something called as the bias okay so bias of winning can also be defined and uh, bias of winning which is called beta can be defined as probability of win minus the probability of lose okay 
uh, and uh, here we can actually uh, instead of uh, saying that outputs are 0 and 1 I could have also said that my outputs are a and b are either minus 1 or plus 1 and then instead of saying that uh, I want that a x or b should be equal to s and t what I can also say is that I want here, here in the new new definition, I can say that the product of a and b is minus 1 to the power s and t. So, which means that if s and t is 0, then I would want their product to be 1, which means that they have the same, uh, which means that essentially a and b are same. And if s and t is 1, then I would want the a, a and b to, to have opposite sign. So, a, will, a b will be minus 1 in that case. So, I can also specify the winning condition in, in this form. And uh, this is essentially important, uh, this bias thing and uh, this definition because this allows us to define uh, uh, binary operators. So, let's review. So, we defined something as binary operation, a, a binary observable. Uh, which has eigenvalues plus 1 and minus 1 where the expected value of this binary observable is, is same as the bias, the probability of win minus lose. So, when we are defining quantum operators, we can define in terms of binary observables and uh, over there it will make sense. Uh, so, so we can actually talk about bias and then we can uh, define A and B in this form in plus minus 1 form for the CHSH game that will help us uh, define the bias uh, that, that will help us define the uh, value of the game more easily. So, note that in this notation, in this notation we have that. So, so now I have a value function v prime. This v prime of a, b, s and t is going to be a, b if s and t is 0 and minus a, b otherwise. And the expected value of this v prime is going to be beta which is bias right and, and what is the beta for the best beta for classical game it is half. So, this is actually the optimal beta uh, for a classical game where, where a probability of win minus lose is 3 fourth minus 1 fourth which is half. So, now the question is that can we improve the expected value can we improve the bias. So, the first strategy which comes to our mind is that well let us still deal with classical operators, but let us allow randomized classical strategy. So, in a randomized classical strategy given input A Alice can out uh, given input S Alice can output a with the distribution as p of a given s and similarly bob this is p superscript a and given t bob can output p with distribution p b of uh, b given t okay then okay, what is the best we can do and uh, the answer is that uh, here we can't do better than 3 fourth And the proof is left as a homework exercise for all of you. Uh, I can give you one hint that uh, what you need to show is that this expected valuation for this randomized strategy is the average over the uh, expectation of each of the deterministic classical strategies. So, you will have to uh, see how to do it, uh, but uh, the, but the answer is that we still can't do better than three fourth. So even if we allow randomized st classical strategies, the best possibility is still three fourth. Yeah. So the next idea, which as the name of the course suggests, is the quantum entangled strategy. So, 
so uh, we'll first uh, show a geometric interpretation to this argument uh, to this strategy so interpretation one which is geometric so here what happens is that alice and bob they share a bell based state So, which is 1 by root 2 0 0 a b plus 1 by root 2 1 1 a b. Okay. And they make a basis measurements on their respective qubits which depends on input. So, make measurements. Based on input. So here I will actually need to use a lemma whose proof is again left as an exercise. So this lemma states that if Alice measures in basis v v sub a and v sub a orthogonal and bob measures in basis W sub B and W sub B orthogonal. Then the probability that they get the same outcome when I say they get the same outcomes, I am interpreting the outcome of this V as 0 and V per plus 1. Similarly, W as 0 and W per plus 1. So, this is what my interpret is. But this is what my interpretation is, then the probability that they get the same outcome is nothing but v dot w in a product squared. Okay. And uh, the proof is again left as an exercise. Yeah, so you all must try this exercise. I will try to post a solution to this as well. Now, what is this randomized strategy? So, on input S, which is which can take 0 or 1, uh, the analysis measurement basis is as follows. So on input 0, the analysis measurement basis is going to be cat 0, cat 1. So Alice holds a single qubit of the TPR pair and uh, she is trying to measure, perform a measurement based on the value of the input. The value of input is 0, she measures in 0, 1 basis. If the value of input is 1, she measures in the plus minus basis. Now let us see what Bob is doing. So, on input T, the Bob's measurement basis is going to be following. So, uh, if T is 0, or T can be either 0 or 1. If T is 0, then Bob measures in pi by 8. 5 pi by 8 basis, if it is 1, measures in minus pi by 8. 
3 pi by 8 basis. So here, so we can understand what is going on a bit geometrically now. So here, if Alice's input is 0, she measures in the 0, 1 basis. If Alice's input is 1, she measures in the plus minus basis. So this is when s equals 1. Oh, uh, just a second. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Now, uh, okay, uh, I think yeah, so this is where I'll represent the plus axis. So when Alice's input is 1, she measures in the plus minus basis. Now when Bob's input is say 0, that is t equals 0, then Bob measures in uh, pi by 8 and its corresponding orthogonal vector uh, 5 pi by 8 sort of basis. And when Bob's input is minus 1, he measures in t. So this angle is pi by 4, this angle is pi by 8 and this angle is also pi by 8. So when Bob's input is uh, going to be 1, then he measures in the minus pi by 8 and 3 pi by 8 sort of basis. Okay. So the thing is that what we want is that when the AND is 0, uh, we want the outputs to be same with high probability. If the AND is 1, then they should be different with high probability. So let us see what is happening here. So when S and T are both 0, okay. so when S and T are say both of them are 0, so, so this is the case, then the angle between them is going to be pi by 8 and uh, the probability that they obtain the same outcome as a result of this lemma, so they measure in, so Alice is measuring VB perp and Bob is measuring in WW perp. So the probability that they get the same outcome is uh, mod squared of V dot W. So when s equals t equals 0, then probability of same outcome, which is also the probability of winning in this case, right? So this is going to be uh, the squared mod of inner product between these two vectors. And these are unit vectors. So the square mod of their inner product is going to be cos square of the angle between them, which is cos square pi by 8. Simple. Now, when s is 1 and t is 0, that is this case, the angle between them is still pi by uh, 8. So here even when the case that s is uh, 1 and t is 0, then the probability of same outcome is still cos square pi by 8. And when s is 0 and t is 1, right, which is this case. So the angle between these two axes is still pi by 8. So probability of winning is still going to be cos square pi by 8. Now let's turn to the case when s equals t equals 1. Now here if we see the angle between them, this, this is the axis for s equals 1, this is the axis for t equals 1. This angle is now going to be 3 pi by 8. So the probability of getting the same outcome is three, uh, cos square 3 pi by 8, but the probability of getting different outcome is 1 minus cos square 3 pi by 8 which is sine square 3 pi by 8, which also happens to be cos square pi by 8. So the probability of getting same, uh, probability of winning here is actually probability of getting different outcome, which is still cos square pi by 8. So overall, average over the four cases, the probability of winning is still cos square pi by 8. 
So there will be a one fourth of you'll have to add all the cases and all cases have the same value which is cos square pi by 8 times 4. So here you just have this is the probability of winning which is cos square pi by 8. And uh, this happens to be something like half plus 1 over 2 root 2. Okay. Uh, so this is actually greater than uh, 3 fourth. So here they win actually with a uh, high probability and uh, actually if you want to know this value is something like 0.85 something. So this is the first analysis which is more geometric. There is also a more sort of uh, more of algebraic analysis which is based on the operator solution. So here actually this is uh, the earlier one is more intuitive but this is more general because we will see that other games such as magic square game and all they will have uh, we will be able to analyze those uh, through this analysis more easily. So here the thing is that for operator solution what we say is as follows that instead of basis measurements what we will talk about is measuring a binary observable and here we will go back to the uh, earlier interpretation where a and b take the value plus 1 and minus 1 and we will try to compute the bias. So here Alice measures using operator AS S is either 0 or 1 on input S and uh, POMP measures using operator B sub T where T is 0 or 1 on input T and both of these are binary variables which means that their eigenvalues are going to be plus or minus 1. So they will measure in the eigenspaces if they get a projector corresponding to plus 1 they output plus 1 if they measure the projector corresponding to minus 1 they output minus 1 and uh, here what we need to ma uh, maximize is the bias of winning. So here because it's easy to analyze for binary observables. So bias of winning in this case is going to be uh, one fourth the sum over S and T, the expected value of V prime, V prime of A, B, S, T. And so let us try to see in the plus minus one case, how do we uh, define the bias? So here we see that uh, this this bias sort of valuation is a b if s and t is 0 or minus a b otherwise and I can actually write it in a more succinct form as minus 1 to the power s and t times a b and the here actually it makes the it makes it very easy to analyze the quantum solution which is as follows. So here, as I said here, the bias of winning is one fourth the sum over S and T expected value of V prime and this is nothing but minus one to the power S and T times the expected value of AB. So let's see how to compute this. So I need to compute one fourth the sum over S and T. Now expected value of AB is going to be psi times a s tensor b t. So both of these are operators which have value plus and minus 1 and if I take the expected value of the tensor product this gives me the uh, expectation of the product of their eigenvalues. So we have already seen earlier that when we define the tensor product of binary observables
yeah so when we define the tensor product of observables we get lambda i lambda j with probability psi a b pi a tensor pi b psi a b so here essentially uh, the this this tensor product has eigenvalues which are lambda i lambda j and uh, the probability of success is measured by the uh, tensor product of the corresponding projectors so here we are just using this that uh, uh, the probability of uh, getting say plus one is going to be the uh, projection onto the space where both are plus one or both are minus one and similarly minus one is going to be where one is minus one other is plus one or vice versa so we see that this is actually the expected value of the valuation in terms of bias and now you need to choose uh, these uh, as and bt appropriately so we are going to choose a naught as z okay so z has uh, eigen uh, vectors as 0 and 1 so it's essentially corresponding to measuring in the 0 1 basis the standard basis a1 is x whose measurements corresponds to measuring in the plus minus basis b0 is h and you can see you can check that eigen vectors are uh, like plus pi by 8 or uh, 5 pi by 8 and b1 over here is going to be zx z. so all these are actually binary observables which mean that their eigenvalues are plus and minus 1 and uh, one way to check is that their square must be 1 okay and they are Hermitian so which means that eigenvalues are real and square to 1 so they can either be plus 1 or minus 1 so here we see that uh, if you substitute this value so you, what you will get is that this bias so this is something which will give you the bias value so when you substitute these operators you get the value of bias as uh, 1 over root 2 okay so this is something i would like you to try uh, for next 10 minutes and you can take a break till then So welcome back after the break and uh, here we will now analyze the general framework of so I hope you were able to solve that uh, although this part is something which I am going to leave as a homework exercise. So here now I plan to discuss the general framework of quantum non-local games. So here in the general framework of quantum non-local games, we can define a game as a tuple. So what we have over here is a set of inputs for Alice. Next we have a set of inputs for Bob. Next we have is Alice's output set. Next we have is Bob's output set. Next we have a distribution pi over inputs. And then we have a valuation function. What is valuation function? It is a function from A cross B, Alice's inputs cross Bob's input cross Alice's, uh, Alice's output cross Bob's output cross Alice's input cross Bob's input to R. So the uh, real valued function here the classical expected value or omega c g is going to be sum over s and t pi s t v of a as a function of s p as a function of t s and t in the quantum case
the quantum case, Alice and Bob share an entangled state. Psi, which lies in H A tensor H B, and for each input S, Alice measures in the POVM setting A S A. Actually, for most cases, it will suffice to have projective measurements only. Uh, we won't need general POVMs. So, you can assume that these are all projective. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, for a fixed value of S, we have a complete set of projections a, uh, AS A1, AS A2, and so on, where AIs are all in the set capital A. Uh, for each input for Bob, for input T, he uses a projective set of measurements uh, BTB and uh, here we see that the quantum expected value is going to be sum over ST, pi ST, next we have sum over AB in A cross B, the probability of getting a and B times the valuation. Okay, so this is what the quantum value is. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we leave it at I leave it at this point, and uh, yeah, so we have ended the lecture. If there are any further questions, you can let me know here or in the comments later as well okay and uh, yeah so essentially here what we are trying to see is that we are trying to averaging over the inputs first so pi st is a distribution over my input set uh, and uh, then then basically i try to compute that for these inputs what is the distribution over output for that distribution i average out v a b s t which is the valuation function in the next lecture i uh, first plan to uh, show that uh, what the quantum strategy which we have discussed for chsh that is actually optimal and uh, if time permits i'll also start the magic square game yeah uh, so thanks and goodbye